Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillahi wahdah wa salatu wa salamu ala malla nabiya ba'dah. Amma ba'd. Ikna is my favorite convention. And within Ikna, young Muslims is my favorite panel to be with. Just don't tell that to the other people or else I'll be in trouble. But alhamdulillah. When I got the topic, I was genuinely surprised because this is a very, very sensitive topic. Talk about cancel culture, you're going to see it right now, whatever I say. There is no way that you can talk about this topic without certain people finding this problematic and the speaker is going to be canceled, the convention is going to be canceled, and those who don't cancel will also be canceled. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the believers when He says, لا يخافون في الله لو متلائم They're not scared of the criticism of the critic. So if we wish to be believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we don't care about the criticism of the critic that is unfounded. Otherwise, we have not done our job. And frankly, brothers and sisters, look around you. Look at how crazy the world has become. Look at what is being taught to our children. Look at even something as simple as marriage and divorce rates. As I mentioned in my recent khutbah that uh, Dr. Asif uh, referenced, I gave it three weeks ago. These statistics shocked me, and I'm, I think I'm well-read and educated in this regard. A hundred years ago in this country, in America, more than 90% of young men and women saved their chastity for the night of marriage. They were virgins till they got married. A hundred years ago, more than 90% of this country had a sense of morality. Now, a staggering 95% of people engage in premarital intercourse. Of what point is marriage when 95% of the population is engaged? A hundred years ago, literally a hundred years ago, over 87% of women above the age of, don't quote me, 25 or something, were married. I.e., 95% or 90% of women are married. Now, less than 50% of people are in a marital situation. The bulk of this country almost is single. The entire family structure has been demolished, altered, rearranged. Brothers and sisters, for how long are we going to be intimidated by the realities of what is going on? For how long are we going to shy away from talking about how and why this is happening? I mean, what are we waiting for? What exactly are we waiting for? Our own brothers and sisters are struggling in marriage. The divorce rates within our own communities are skyrocketing. The spinsterhood, the number of young qualified Muslimas that are struggling to find a practicing decent husband is on the rise. And on top of this, we have the rise of the far right, the extreme toxic masculinity that many of us, including myself, have spoken out against. Now here's my blunt question to all of you. If we don't provide a moderate discourse that is politically incorrect because we do have to mention masculinity and femininity that is proper, that is Islamic. If we are too scared, if we're too intimidated to address directly what it means to be a proper Muslim man and a proper Muslim a female, if we're too scared to challenge the stereotypes of the far left and the far right, can we blame society around us for going to these extremes, for finding refuge in toxicity because we're too scared to present the moderate middle? Every one of us has to be brave enough to challenge. Every one of us 
has to understand and realize that these radical changes, and I did mention indirectly in my khutbah three weeks ago, and please do listen to it if you haven't listened to it yet about transgenderism. I did mention the big elephant in the room that a lot of people are scared to bring up. And that is the changing societal norms of what it means to be a man and a woman. Under the guise of liberating women, under the guise of rediscovering femininity, certain interpretations of feminism, certain interpretations and strands of feminism began challenging healthy femininity. Femininity that is frankly divine. Femininity that is encapsulated by Jannah is under the feet of the mother. There is a reason why that femininity is a spark of divinity in it. There's a reason why from our childhood we have been taught that there's something special about the mother. When you come and you mock that, when you come and you stereotype it, when you come and you say that is not the default, and the real power of a woman, frankly, is to be like a man, to challenge a man, to posit that there is a competition between masculinity and femininity. When you come with this ideology and you allow a hundred years to take place, which is what has happened in our country, well then, look at the shambles and results. Look at the destruction. Look at the reality of what is left of what it means to be a decent family man or woman. So I'm sorry, enough is enough. Because frankly, we as the Muslim community are the last bastions of morality on earth. No other civilization, no other mainstream Abrahamic trend remains. Sure, pockets of Catholics, pockets of you know, Orthodox Jews, but they're not doing their job as much as they should. They're shying away. Many are capitulating. If we are going to capitulate, none shall be left. And inshallah, we're not going to capitulate. We're not going to acquiesce. Why? Because Allah has appointed us. Allah has appointed us to have a higher role. We're not worried about brownie points. We're not worried about acceptability. We're not worried about political correctness. We're not worried about wokeness. We are worried about the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas. You are the best of all ummas that Allah has created for mankind. Why? Because we're politically correct? Because we're woke? Because we're popular? No. Ta'muruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. You stand up and preach what is right and forbid what is wrong. And Allah warns us if you don't do this job, I created you to be preachers of good and warners against evil. That is your task. That is your role. Then Allah says, if you don't do this job, فَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبِدِ الْقَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُونُ أَمْثَالُكُمْ Allah will get rid of you and bring another group and they're not going to be like you. They're going to be better than you. So we have a simple mandate and that mandate is we are going to preach the truth regardless of the criticism of the critic, regardless of the trouble it gets into. And if we don't do so, well, Allah has promised that the truth will prevail in spite of me and you. Either we stand up and preach, or else Allah will bring somebody else to preach. Simple. So because of this, today's brief talk, and by the way, where's the counter? I need a time before, you know, you call the moderator Malak al I really felt sorry for him. Inshallah, he's not Malak al inshallah. That's a bit of a, any, <laughs> inshallah, he's Malak al rahma inshallah, uh, coming to keep things in check. I know you meant it as a joke, inshallah. How much time do I have so that I keep my time slot? Where's the moderator? Can somebody tell me how much time I have? How much time do I have? Okay, so uh, the moderator has said I have 15 minutes, okay? So inshallah, I will get to the most explicit verse and I'm going to dive into the deep end. May Allah protect me. I'm going to go where hardly anybody else goes because frankly, what's the point of shying away? It's in the Quran. Which verse am I talking about? Surah An-Nisa verse 34. And I want you to write this verse down. 
If you have an, uh, a translation app, if you have something to look it up, uh, I wish I had prepared a slide, but I, I didn't do so. I'm very PowerPoint illiterate. I can't stand PowerPoint preparing. I like to see them, but I don't have time to, or patience to prepare them. But if you have an app, please look it up. Surah An-Nisa verse 34. Surah An-Nisa verse 34. And this verse is, frankly, the most explicit verse about gender roles in the Quran. So you must know it. Now I will summarize an interpretation and I want to be very clear. If you for whatever reason don't agree with my interpretation, no problem. But I need you to do your homework and to go back to tafasir and to look up what scholars of exegesis and scholars of hadith and scholars of Quran have said and then form an alternative interpretation that is consistent with the verse and the goals of the Sharia. Ah. I am not arrogant to claim my way is the only interpretation. But what I'm about to say is fairly mainstream with slight modifications from modernity which I believe are possible to make. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, الرجال قوام على النساء Men are قوام over women. This is really explicit. Frankly, the verse is politically incorrect. But I don't care because I believe in the Quran and I don't believe in political correctness. For me, what Allah says matters. الرجال قوامون على النساء Now, of course, what does this verse mean is the million dollar question. Let's begin. Firstly, Allah says, very important, الرجال. Now, in the Arabic language, you have a number of terms for male. The most common term for male is ذكر. Allah says, خَلَقَ الزَّوْجَيْنَ الذَّكَرْ وَالْأُنْثَى Allah created us in two genders, the male and the female. Dhakar, dhukur. Okay? Khalaqakum min dhakar. Allah created us from one dhakar, from one male. In this verse, Allah did not use the term dhukur. A dhukur, qawwam, al untha. No. Allah said, ar rijal. Why? Listen to me carefully. And I wish I had a PowerPoint slide, but if you just write this down. Every rajul is a dhakar, not every dhakar is a rajul. Every rajul is a dhakar. I'll translate. Not every dhakar is a rajul. Rijal is a characteristic you acquire. It's not something you're born with. Allah did not say, and this is how most people translate it, men are responsible over women. If that were the verse, it would be a dhukur. Allah didn't say dhukur. Allah said rijal. And rijal is a characteristic that is acquired after being a biological man. Not every biological man is worthy of being qiwam over a woman. No, 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 no. You earn that right. You strive for that privilege. Just because you're born with a particular chromosome and a particular genitalia does not give you the right to have qiwama over a woman. No, not at all. In order to get that qiwama, and I'll translate qiwama, the problem is every word has to be translated. In order to get that qiwama, you have to earn it. And you earn it by becoming a rajul. You're born, the men in the audience, you're born a dhakar. But you have to become a rajul. And if you don't become a rajul, then you don't deserve the qiwama. It's as simple as that. Okay? Now, I'm speaking in Arabic. I know there are people in the audience that don't know these words. So I have to, for those who understood, you're all clapping, alhamdulillah. For those who didn't understand, I got to deconstruct every single word. You understood rajul and dhakar. What is a rajul? A rajul is a biological man who has acquired proper Islamic, healthy masculine qualities. Not toxic masculinity. No. Allah Azza wa Jal praises in the Quran. Allah never praises mere dhakar and inath, dhakar and untha. That's not anything to be praised. We're equal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explicitly says in the Quran when it comes to being a man or being a woman. 
لِلْرِّجَالِ نَصِيبٌ وَلِلنِّسَاءِ نَصِيبٌ You both have your shares. Allah says in the Quran, فَاسْتَجَابَ لَهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ أَنِّي لَا أُضِيُ عَمَلَ عَامِلٍ مِّنْكُمْ مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى Notice, بَعْضُكُمْ مِّنْ بَعْضٍ ذَكَرْ أُنْثَى The two are the same. Notice, when Allah talks about biological sex, when Allah talks about being an XX or XY chromosome, Allah says, I'm not going to discriminate. This is literally in the Quran, the last page of Surah Ali Imran. I'm not going to discriminate between a biological male and a biological female. The two of you are equal. You each come from one another. Whoever does a good deed will get the reward of that good deed regardless of their biological sex. And that is ultimate equality. Your humanity, your nobility, your worth in the eyes of Allah has nothing to do with your chromosomes and your genitalia. You are equally human in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, that equality is explicit and guaranteed. But when it comes to the tasks, when it comes to the roles, when it comes to the responsibilities, of being a true man or a true woman, well, وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى Biologically even, the man and the woman are not the same. And there are differences biologically. There are differences hormonally. There are differences physically. There are differences physiologically. There are differences in muscle density, in bone density. You can, uh, you can unearth the skeleton of a, a, a person over a million years old, and by the skeleton, you can tell whether they're male or female. وَلَيْسَ ذَكَرُكَ الْأُنْثَى Every cell in your body can be taken to a lab and without telling who the person is, the person in the lab can say, this is a male or female. Down to your cells, you are different. From the bones, you are different. Physically, you are different. So when you're different, top to bottom, surely the tasks assigned to you should also be different. There is no discrimination. The one gender is not more noble than the other. And frankly, I'm going to be blunt here, the fundamental problem of some strands of feminism, again, some strands, because again, pause here, footnote, as I like to say, we should not criticize feminism in totality. Some aspects of feminism are Islamic. The first wave of feminism gave women rights that Islam gave 1,400 years ago, right? So we should not criticize feminism in totality. Rather, when we want to criticize, we criticize specific concepts. Leaves the term out of it. Some aspects of feminism are within Islam. Some aspects are ambiguous and changeable. And some aspects are completely antithetical. So the entirety of the movement should not be praised or criticized. If you want to, you can be more specific. So, some strands of feminism, like I'm saying, they posited a competition between the man and the woman. And whether they admitted or not, they privileged the status of a man. They said, because the man does these things, he is privileged. Then they said, it's not fair, the woman does not do these things. So then the whole injustice began, and the whole notion of discrimination began. The very problem of positing a competition is itself un-Islamic. There is no competition. Husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, you are on the same team. You're not competing against one another. This is the fundamental problem of some strands of feminism. Your net worth is not by competing with the other gender. Your net worth is not decided by whether you can take on the tasks of a man, the chores of a man, the job of a man. No. Allah created you and gifted you with certain differences than the other gender. Because of this, your roles are different. So, going back to the ayah. I said Allah praises rujula in the Quran. He doesn't praise dhukura in the Quran. Dhakar is not praised. You're a biological fact. Rujula is praised. Min al mu'minina rijalun sadaqu ma'ahadu Allah alayhi. Right? Allah Azza wa Jal says that رِجَالٌ لَا تُلِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْنَ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Multiple ayat praise being a rajul, a man. And these ayat, if you do a whole survey of them, they talk about sacrifice. Sacrificing the dunya for the akhirah. Sacrificing your businesses for the masjid. That is a sign of manhood. You want to be a man? 
frankly, brothers and sisters, it has little to do with going to the gym. Even though, yes, it's healthy to be healthy. I'm not putting that down. But the stereotype of being a masculine with your pumped up, you know, uh, uh, biceps and, you know, taking all these uh, hormones to be more powerful or whatnot. Allah praises men who pray to hajjud. That's being a man. Allah praises men who defend. Allah praises giving up wealth for the sake of the akhirah. That is what being a man is. Now, don't get me wrong. It's very healthy. Go to the gym. I'm not criticizing that. But... The stereotype of masculinity being only physical, I'm sorry, no. The Quran never praises that version of masculinity. The Quran praises characteristics of courage, of bravery, of sacrifice, of prioritizing Allah's pleasure over your own personal pleasures. That is being a man. So Allah praises rujula in this manner. As I said, not every dhakar is a rajul, but every rajul is a dhakar. Now you understand, right? Dhakar is a biological male. Rajul is a male who has acquired positive Islamic masculinity, not toxic masculinity. No, toxic masculinity has nothing to do with Rajul. You don't be a Rajul by putting men down, women down, astaghfirullah. You don't be a Rajul by making women feel unsafe. You want to be a Rajul? Follow when Allah Azza wa Jal praised Musa in the Quran. Musa in that interaction with the two young ladies, one of whom he ended up marrying. And I say publicly, if the Quran has a type of halal version of a love story, this is it. Because there is emotions involved. She comes shy, she's embarrassed, she feels, you know, this is a strong man defending me. The whole story, this is what it means to be a man. Musa alayhi salam took care of, defended, helped two young ladies without taking advantage of them. Not exchanging phone numbers or text messages, okay? Didn't sneak in, oh, this is my WhatsApp, contact me. Some of the scholars of tafsir say, the women were being harassed, catcalled by the shepherds, right? There are two young ladies in a man's world. These are men shepherds, they're taking care of their whatnot. And Musa felt that this is not appropriate. He needs to intervene. He cannot allow, even though the two ladies were not Muslim, even though the two ladies are not related to him, but as a man, as a rajul, he cannot allow women to be intimidated in front of him by these other strange men. And so Musa alayhi salam walks up to them and exudes a modesty that allows the two ladies to open up to him. And they're not opening up to their own kith and kin, their own same co-compatriots, the same ethnicity, the same religion. Those shepherds, they didn't feel safe with them. Musa comes as a stranger, as an outsider, not of the same faith, not of the same ethnicity, but he exudes masculinity, true masculinity. And the scholars say he approached them with the level of shyness that a man should have, looking down, speaking in a manner that shows he wants to protect them. And he goes, what are you two doing here? Like you're getting these cat calls, you're making fun of, what are you two doing here? Right? And they explained, our father's sick and elderly, we don't have enough money to hire a shepherd, we're the only people, we don't have brothers, that's why we're doing a man's job. By the way, we all know, it's of course when there's no man to do the job, of course the woman's going to do the job. Nobody's denying that, of course it's halal. But I'm not going to shy away from saying there's a default of a man's job and a default of a woman's job. And until we say this, until we're skirting around it, we're never going to get to the root of the problem. Yes, there's always exceptions, but Nothing, nothing is better for a man than to be a protector, a provider, a maintainer, a defender. And nothing is better for a woman to be in the role of a mother, a compassionate caregiver, a caretaker. These are the ideals. Are there exceptions? Of course there are exceptions. But let's not forget the ideal. So Musa alayhi salam gives that impression that I will take care of you. I'm going to make sure that everything is fine. So they entrusted him. And as soon as they entrust him, he does the job that men do. He takes care of the sheep. He gives them back. And then he walks away. This is the ideal time for flirtation. The ideal time for quid pro quo. If you get my drift. The ideal, but no, that's not what a man does. This is rujula in the Quran. So Allah says, Ar-rijalu qawwamuna ala nisa Not men, but masculine men. Men who have Islamic masculinity. Men who are gentlemen. This is how you should translate the verse. Men who have acquired the characteristics of being a gentleman. Those men, they are qiwam over women. What does qiwam mean? 
a lot of people mistranslate and say that men are the people in charge of. As if you're the boss, as if whatever you say goes. No, look up your lexic lexicons. Look up the meaning of qiwama. The number one meaning of qiwama to maintain and to protect. Men are the protectors of women. Men are the ones who sacrifice for women. Men are the ones who have to make sure women are taken care of, women are protected, women have everything they need. That is the job of a man and we don't care how politically incorrect it is. So when a dhakar becomes a rajul, that rajul earns the right of another rajul to give his daughter over in marriage to this rajul and say, you know what? You are a rajul, you will take care of my daughter. Protect my daughter. Ar-rijalu qawamuna ala nisa The ultimate meaning of qiwama has nothing to do with obedience. This is a misunderstanding. The primary meaning of qiwama is to protect and maintain, to take care of. That's what qiwama means. That's the job of a man to go defend, to go fight, to go take care of. That's what a man does. If need be, he sacrifices his life for the women. That's what a real man does. There is nothing in this ayah about men are bosses over women. Men are kings over women. No, where'd you get this from? Qiwama implies protection and safety and maintenance. Now, I'm gonna go on because the verse is very controversial. But it is a verse of the Quran. You don't agree with me, go find another interpretation, good for you. But I'm gonna move, translate the next phrase. Allah Azza wa Jal says, I'm watching the time, five minutes inshallah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, men are qiwam over women, then Allah says, because of two reasons. And I need you to pay attention, this is a very deep and profound ayah. Wallahi, I, I have thought about this ayah for many, many dozens of hours. I've contemplated red tafasil and what I understood from this verse, to me, it was mind-boggling. It was altering my perception, really, of you know, the realities of going on, and it really explained to me why we see what we see. So I'm going to try to summarize you know, uh, what, what I have derived from the ayah in a few minutes. Pay attention to this. Men are qiwam over women. Then Allah says, I'm going to tell you why. And this is really cool, really interesting. Allah did not just say, because I say so. Even though if he said so, and he did say so, it's good enough for us. But Allah wanted to explain why did I say rijal or qiwam over women. There's a reason why I said this. And Allah told us two reasons in the Quran because of which rijal or qiwam over women. Are you guys following me so far? Are you guys following me? Two reasons in the Quran. The one, bima faddala Allahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. And the two, وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ Number one reason, because Allah gave certain biological characteristics to the one that He did not give to the other. Biologically, the man is not like the woman. And so, the one of them has certain characteristics that help in the job of qiwama. And the other has characteristics that help in the job of what she is doing, which is to be a provider, to be a nourisher, to be a, 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 a loving and a supporting mother to the children, to be a housewife that is helping the husband, to be a maintainer of the household. They have what they need and they have what they need. So when you want to be a qiwam, when you want to take charge and fight and lay your life down and go and whatnot, you need to be physically different. And so Allah has given the male characteristics that are suited for the qiwama. Biologically, now again, it's self-evident. The man is, generally speaking, faster and stronger and physically more powerful. Actually, the bone densities, the mass of the, the muscles, the height, everything. That's why in the Olympics, men and women don't compete together. I mean, I mean, how much more political correctness do you want, right? There's never the same tracks. It's just the way things are. So, biologically, men are different than women. And so, what men have in terms of whatever they have suits them for qiwama. Now, number one is that. Number two, وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ And because the one is obliged to spend their money on the other, financial, fiscal. 
A woman never has to spend a penny on herself Islamically. You all know this. From the day she's born till the day she leaves this earth, she is always being taken care of by her father or her brother or her husband or her son. Ideally, I know it doesn't always work out. Ideally, Sharia says this. Whether some husbands don't act like Rijal, whether some brothers don't act like you know Rijal and they don't treat their sisters properly, that's definitely a problem. But the default is that women are protected and maintained in the Sharia from birth to, to death. We know this. Now, Allah Azza wa mentions two reasons. Number one, biological. And number two, financial or fiscal. Time is up. I'm going to conclude on this point. To me, it was mind-boggling. When you look at the modern world we live in, the post-industrial, post-mechanized world that we live in, we're no longer living in hunter-gatherer societies where we have to go hunt our food. We're no, no, no longer living under threat of war where we live in gated communities and the cities have their walls up and we're worried about an invasion every second, third day. Our civil societies calm down by and large in the Western world. And our intellectual output has leveled the playing field biologically. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. When you're in front of a computer, your typing speed is the same. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman. When it comes to 80, 90% of the jobs we do in corporate America, intellectually, IQ-wise, it is true. Each one is slightly different, but IQ-wise, they're pretty much the same. True, the way a man thinks, the way a woman thinks is slightly different, but intellectually, they're at a similar level. Not, the one is not bigger than the other. We know this. Frankly, usually the women get the better grades than the men. We know this. But anyway, that's a separate one altogether. I know as I'm a professor, as a professor, I say, usually the default is, subhanAllah, you know, their notes are better. All these multicolored, you know, pens and whatnot. The cleaner handwriting, okay? Better t taking of the notes, better uh, uh, memorization skills, better answering of the, you know, comprehension exam. So anyway, khair. Let's just say, for, to be politically correct, they're roughly the same. Even though one is better than the other, but let's leave that aside, okay? Let's just say they're roughly the same, because generally IQ tests show they're roughly the same. Now, in the modern world we live in, one doesn't need physical strength to do most of the tasks and chores that the job requires. When situation in society changes such that physical prowess is required, all of a sudden, Qiwama comes back. The war in Ukraine, the president announced women and children may leave. All men between the ages of 18 to 60 must remain and fight. Sorry to be crude, where were the feminists clamoring for equality then? It's not going to happen. When civil society flattens the curve, and you don't need men hunting, gathering. You don't need men defending. You don't need men laboring in the fields like once upon a time used to happen. Then one of the reasons of Qiwama will be diminished. You guys following me? And when post-World War II, second wave feminism wishes to change corporate life, because it's only been one generation a lot of you guys don't understand this, and women don't understand this. One generation, that's it. Look at any black and white movie from the 40s and 50s. Go read any book of sociology, anthropology, history. It's been one generation where men and women have similar jobs in corporate America. One generation, literally. Back in the 20s and 30s, the track fields, the, 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 uh, the notion of what a woman should do, what a man should do, were distinct and separate. I'm not saying right or wrong. That's the way it was. One generation. Fiscal responsibilities have merged. And post-World War II, second and third wave feminism have brought a change such that in our generation, and I'm not saying good or bad, I'm being factual right now. In our generation, the average man and the average woman are both working and earning money. So, the second reason for Qiwama has been diminished as well. Don't be surprised in the world that we live in when the biological differences don't, care, don't play a role, and when fiscal responsibilities are shared, don't be surprised when the reality of how Allah created us, الرِّجَالُ قَوَمُونَ عَلَى nisa is also being disrupted. Because the two reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned for this default, that both of them really no longer exist in society. So because they no longer exist in society, we're now seeing a new reality. 
This new reality can only function when both of these reasons don't exist. The minute these reasons return, look at Ukraine. The minute these two reasons return, Qiwam is going to return the way the default is in the way that Allah created us. Now, bottom line to conclude. We live at a time and place where it's not my fault, it's not your fault, both of these reasons have changed. It's not necessarily evil that these reasons have changed. It's not necessarily evil. Nothing wrong with a woman having a job and education. Nothing wrong with a man, you know, having less financial responsibility. These days, two income homes are the normal. You know, both husband and wife work and they pay for their rent. Nothing wrong with that. So my notion is not whether it's haram or halal, but my notion is let us never forget the default. Let us never forget the ideal situation. Because that ideal is something we do strive for. And even if we cannot meet 100%, if we can meet it partially, if we can sacrifice a little bit, if it's possible for a family to live on one income, and if it's possible for the mother to take care of the children as a priority, then I will say bluntly, there is nothing better than that. Given how this world is corrupting our children, given the forces, dark forces in this world that are out there to brainwash your own kids, nothing will protect your children's iman stronger than a loving mother. Nothing is gonna protect Islam in the next generation than a mother who is there 24-7 for the children. And that is a biological and a fitri and a shari reality that we should not be ashamed of. Bottom line, brothers and sisters, bottom line, we all have to adapt to the circumstances and to a great extent, that adaptation is halal. It's permissible, it's okay. So be it. Let us not forget though what the ideal is. And let us strive in our lives to at least Try to come close to that ideal as much as possible. And in the end of the day, Fattakullaha Mastata'atum. We do what we can. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the courage. May Allah give us the courage to speak the truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the fortitude to act upon that truth. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all to be role model men, those of us that are men, and to be role model women, those of us that are women. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all righteous partners, righteous spouses that bring out the best of the masculinity or femininity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect our children and their children after them. Wa jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.